first thing we need to broaden up. I said in the previous presentation or previous part of the presentation, 1107 is our Bible. Do you find 1107 in this presentation? In this slide? I help you. There it is. You also know 91414, the predecessor. So what I want to show you with this slide is that for biorationals background, there is a lot more legislation, a lot differing legislation. But of course, the procedural issues are still governed by our 1107. And then you don't have to read it as always I guide you through. In 2017, 37% of the EU budget was introduced in this area of expertise, in this area that is key to the EU, key not only to Green parties, but key to all commissions. And uh, as I was saying just last Tuesday, the agricultural ministers have put, have pledged to put, uh, 30, 387 billion euros over the next seven years into this kind of legislative framework, into the Green Deal. This money is very significant and there is of course the possibility that you participate in getting some of this money, either through selling your products from the farmer uh, so you get the money indirectly through the farmer, but there's also grant money in it, supporting research, supporting strategies to implement a Green Deal uh, uh, issues in companies as well. 1107, still our centerpiece for technical issues. But it was actually published together with three other pieces of legislation, and I'm not going through all of them, but machinery for pesticide application. Everybody spontaneously thinks precision agriculture. Yes, precision agriculture. Then the sustainable use directive. This is actually the directive that introduced and made mandatory for professional users the integrated pest management since 2014. So I think those two are helping us, are allowing us to have a future agriculture which will consist in an integrated way, integrated pest management of classical chemicals, biorationals and precision agriculture. I mentioned last time low-risk active substances. Low-risk active substances have two pieces of legislation to them. One, laying out the detailed rules when an active substance, which could be chemical, which could be non-chemical, is considered to be a low-risk active substance. We are not going into this. You can read it and it is very clearly explained. I want to dwell a little bit on the EPO guideline because I think it is important and it shows the way such argumentation goes. You do not even have to rely on the money the agricultural ministers have pledged for the Green Deal. If you have a low risk active substance, this guidance allows you to extrapolate from a limited number of trials to a larger number of uses saving money, making development and registration cheaper. So this is already one of the legislations that allows low-risk active substances from wherever they might come to be less expensive in their development than classical chemicals. So it is of course also open to you to enter this path of future assessment. I told you the European Parliament is not green, 9.5% only are associated with Green Party members. Still, we know that the Parliament is very active and 
we would like to look at some of those uh, European Parliament resolutions that they have issued. They are talking about the implementation of plant protection product regulation. They have special concern for low risk and biological active substances. But down here, they are actually referring to the sustainable use directive. And that is what I've already mentioned. The sustainable use directive calls for an integrated pest management. And that's the key part that I see in the sustainable use directive. We take a, a closer look at this in the following slides. Sustainable use of pesticides is an issue. Um, and this is where the EU should go. The EU should be going into towards a more environmentally sustainable agricultural practice. And they complain that currently the legislation is not sufficiently aligned uh, with those issues that they want to promote. Remember, European Parliament, 9.5% Green parties only. So they call also for 1107 to be amended into a way that would allow a more sustainable use, more integrated pest management. And that is the point. Integrated pest management will not be against classical chemicals. To the contrary, they should be integrated in a clever scheme of pest management, especially as, for example, resistance breaker, especially to cap the peaks of an infection. We have two, opportunity, uh, two possibilities as a company. We can fight it, leave the market, or we can use it as an argumentation, as a possibility, as something we can develop as a strategic issue within our companies. We have two ways of uh, using this or reacting to it. We can withdraw as a company from the market, or we have the possibility to actively, strategically orient us to adjust to the new situation that Europe is putting up. And there is more development for such active substances. You see here, and I put it up because of this reason, that the European Parliament also calls into question the data requirements for non-chemical active substances. So far, the data requirements have been developed by four active substances, and then they have just been put over anything else. This is not pertinent because as a non-chemical substance, you have to answer many questions which do not make sense because you're not a chemical. So if these things will be pursued, and it is my opinion that they will be pursued in a clever way, they are pursued the authorization and approval of non-chemical active substances will be less expensive, more straightforward, and hopefully, although I'm reluctant to believe myself, in a timely manner. But we can always hope for the best. So now we move on. Farm to fork strategy, which is one part of the Green Deal. We are entering from the retrospect that we have discussed so far in the bio rational section, the future. I repeat, it's a conservative commission that had put, has put the Green Deal through. Now, I'm not reading all this out to you. There are some slides where agriculture and plant protection is not mentioned. You want the whole picture because you need to know this to assess the situation fully. But here is the first time I want to show you why I think withdrawing from the European market is not an option for global companies. EU wants the EU food system as a global standard for sustainability. What does that mean? 
That does not necessarily mean we are the EU and then nothing will happen. This is the message that we think, EU thinks, this is the future. And they will try and they will be successful in exporting parts of this into other uh, countries, into other markets. And yes, you can withdraw from the EU market, but you cannot withdraw from all your markets. Instead, you can react to the EU market now and then be able to act in other markets in the future. So what is, I'm going through the slide briefly, what is the intention? Speed up market adoption of a circular-based economy, biofertilizers and biochemicals. If you go in this direction, authorities will help you. And this is the infamous sentence, and I've put it up. It'll come up twice in the presentation. We must face it. This is in the Green Deal. Remove the overall use and risk of chemical pesticides by 50% by 2030. I think maybe the 50% are not realistic because we need to consider, as the managing director of EFSA said, the benefits. What if a certain active substance is not in the market? And we need to also consider uh, resistance management. And this is the future of active substances. But this is a political issue and we will see how it will develop. We will see how industry too will adopt to this situation. Development of integrated nutrient management to reduce nutrient losses may be very interesting for biostimulant producers which also are related to biopesticides or chemical pesticides as well. And then we come back again to the finance of the ecosystem. And this is, I repeat, 387 billion euros over the next seven years. Action plan, there is still agriculture in it. We tend to argue that agriculture should be kicked out of Europe. No, it should not. It should be uh, sustainable. But in all those legislations that are coming up, there is no way, nowhere, the idea of cancelling agricultures. What are the actions that are to be implemented in a certain time frame? I'm not going through all of them. But one is ensuring food supply and food security. Again, agriculture has a future. Integrated pest management, enhance integrated pest management. In the pest, integrated pest management, classical chemicals still have their place, still are an integral and important part as well. And then facilitate placing on the market plant protection products containing biological active substances. All the money is going in there, pushing this sector as well. Next part of the Green Deal is the biodiversity strategy. I'm not reading it to you, but agriculture again is an issue. You can read it. There are a lot of catchphrases in there. What can we do? I think industry and industry association in their marketing, and I will show some exam one example, uh, must take up this argumentation, must adhere to this argumentation, because we have something to say to the public, something important to say to the public. What are the aims? Again, the infamous 50% reduction. But at the same time, some areas are completed, some markets, but at the same time, some markets are opening up for non-chemical active substances. And there is money in them, and there is being money put into them by the European Union. Then we have one sentence here, agricultural land 
under organic farming should be raised to 25%. It's also such a catchphrase and such an issue to worry. But is it? We'll take a look at it later on. For an ambitious global biodiversity agenda. We're not going through this. This is global. Again, I'm saying the EU will not stop at its borders with this argumentation. The EU is actually and will be pushing for an international agenda, for a global international agenda. And this is where your companies must start to think how to react to this situation. Biodiversity actions. Again, I'm putting only two points out. Integrated pest management, yes, we've talked about, uh, about it many times. Organic farming to be increased, we've already mentioned that previously. Now, what does that mean, organic farming being increased to 25%? Are we to be worried about it? To some extent, yes. But is it this big monster that will kill us all? I don't think so. Look at Austria. To my knowledge, Austria is still a small, but a market for chemical active substances. And by the way, organic farming also needs chemical active substances or active substances, but they are more selective. Austria, still being a market for chemicals, has already 24.1% of organic farming. So organic farming and classical farming and the classical chemicals market could be in one country and could successfully be within one country. We look at this. Spain is a huge and important market for classical chemicals. 9.3% organic farming already. Italy, also to my knowledge, an important market. 15.2% organic farming already. And then, of course, Austria, not such a big market. 24.1% of organic farming already. Let's look briefly at some feedback. European Parliament has a lot to say, but as the EFSA person, the managing director of EFSA, looking at a holistic view, again, holistic view, if we recall what uh, Mr. Yuri said, includes integrated pest management benefits, food safety, as well as integrated pest management. So what does the member state France say? France always thinking more globally than we Germans do, I'm afraid. So France is actually stating, yes, this is a good development for the EU, but all new EU trade agreements should include argumentation as to why this is good and why it should not impede European farming. They are already looking beyond the borders. And this is why I say it is necessary to react now. France and Germany together have uh, issued some statement. And uh, again, they are talking about WTO implementation. In this case, about carbon leakage related to what we are talking about included in the Green Deal. But they won't not stop at the European border. They will go beyond and they will go through the WTO uh, pathway to implement it or to export it into the world. More critical is the European Fertilizer Association. Many challenges, but also opportunities. And down here comes the same argument. They say, we want a level playing field. How do we get a level playing field? We get a level playing field in, by arguing cross-border, in this case also carbon exchange mechanism. Europe, Europe will not stop at its borders with its argumentation. 
What does the European Farmers Association say? Taking into account global markets. This is what I think will be stated, is stated by all the participants that we have seen so far. Finally, this is the Organic Farming Association. They are positive to an extent, but reminding you also organic farming is interested and needs uh, crop protection agencies, crop protection products. Finally, ECPA, the European uh, Crop Protection Association. Of course, they are critical. As I've said, the 50%, we'll see. It's a political number. We'll see how it will develop. But also here, reduction of an innovative pesticide. And this is an argument that associations should take up, that companies should take up. An intensive farming, an intensive agriculture is protective to nature. And that is what we need to see. And this is what we need to communicate. If we have an intensive farming area, all the area around it can become or can be nature. If we have not such intensive farming, we need more land. We need more farmland depleting it from its natural possibilities. So this is also an argumentation. So we have entered a political process. It's not the end of the process. This is the beginning of the process. So uh, with that, I would like to finalize, close the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.